Welcome to Valley Church in Cupertino, California. We are now in our eighth month of bringing church services over the internet. And it is our hope that you are receiving as much of a blessing as we are in producing it. God deserves all the glory through Jesus Christ, our blessed Savior. My name is Dumir Liu, and I will be leading our congregational singing this morning as we praise the Lord together. Let's start our worship together in prayer. Holy Father, we are so grateful for the plan you laid out thousands of years ago to make a way for us to enjoy a personal relation with you. And through Jesus Christ in our lives. Lord, so we ask and ju just that you would please bless the songs and the teaching of your word this morning. And we pray these things all in Jesus' name. Amen. Give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds. Comes from Psalm 107, verse 8. Let's sing together for the beauty of the earth. when we feel so unworthy of the love that Jesus gives us. And it makes us want to say and to sing along with this song that Jesus loves even me. Let's sing this together. I am so glad that our Father in heaven tells of his love in the book he has given wonderful things in the bible i see this is the dearest that jesus loves me i am so glad that jesus loves me jesus loves me jesus loves me i am so glad that jesus loves me jesus loves even me though i forget him and wander away still 
still he doth love me wherever I stray. Back to his dear loving arms would I flee when I remember that Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves even me. only one song I can sing when is the beauty I see the great king this shall my song in eternity be oh what a wonder that Jesus loves me I am so glad that Jesus loves me Jesus loves me Jesus loves me I am so glad that Jesus loves me Jesus loves even me We've come to a point in our service now to receive an offering, and we've provided a way for you to do that over the internet. On your screen, you're going to be seeing a URL that you can type into your computer and just click on the link that says give. The Lord appreciates a happy giver. And let's uh, ask a blessing on this offering. Lord, we thank you for your daily bread, and really more than it is necessary for simple living. Today, we want to give back to you an offering from what you have allowed us to accrue. And so please take these gifts and use them to further the work of your kingdom through the work and ministries of Valley Church. And we just pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
There's a verse in this next hymn that we're about to sing that says, I will praise him. I will praise him. Praise the lamb for sinners slain. Give him glory, all ye people, for his blood can wash away each stain. Let's sing, I will praise him together. my soul. Something happened and now I know he touched me and made me whole. Shackled by a heavy burden, Since I met this blessing 
blessed Savior, since He cleansed and made me whole, I will never cease to praise Him. I'll shout it while eternity rolls. He touched me, oh. Our scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Matthew, chapter 9, verses 18 through 26. While he was saying these things to them, behold, a ruler came in and knelt before him, saying, My daughter has just died, but come and lay your hand on her, and she will live. And Jesus rose and followed him with his disciples. And behold, a woman who had suffered from a discharge of blood for twelve years came up behind him and touched the fringe of his garment. For she said to herself, If I only touch his garment, I will be made well. Jesus turned, and seeing her, he said, Take heart, daughter, your faith has made you well. And instantly the woman was made well. And when Jesus came to the ruler's house and saw the flute players and the crowd making a commotion, he said, Go away, for the girl is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. But when the crowd had been put, a, put outside, he went in and took her by the hand, and the girl arose. And the report of this went through, out, throughout all that district. Hello, Cheryl Strayed, and hello, Valley Church. My name is Darren, and Cheryl, I just have to tell you that I am a fan of your memoir, Wild, published in 2012, subtitle, From Lost to Found on the Pacific Crest Trail. And Cheryl, I want you to meet my church, Valley Church, and Valley Church, I want you to meet Cheryl and, and Valley, I want you to know, if you haven't read the book, that Wild is the story of how you, Cheryl, trudged an absolutely insane stretch of the Pacific Crest Trail in the summer of 1995, when you were just 26 years old, and as you write, unmoored by sorrow and loose in the world. And you hauled this 70 pound backpack, which you nicknamed Monster, all along the way. Well, Cheryl, congratulations, because this is the 25th anniversary this last summer of your famous hike that inspired the book. And I just want to tell you that I really enjoyed the adventure of it, your encounters with bears and rattlesnakes, and even a friendly llama, and uh, a little army of black frogs that marched over you while you were taking a nap one day on a fallen log. And I read somewhere that that was actually Oprah Winfrey's favorite scene in the book. Well, Cheryl, a little bit about us. Valley Church is just down the street from Apple Computer in Cupertino, California. We are uh, a church that's very diverse. We have people from all over the world. And here's my start with the book Wild. My brother Dan recommended it to me. And I have to tell you, from the minute I downloaded it onto my phone from my public library and hit the play arrow, I was totally hooked. In fact, so much so that an e-copy uh, borrowed from the library wouldn't do. And I had to order my own copy of Wild. And it's, it's used but in excellent condition and hardback and first edition. Um, well, you can see, I hope, from the dense forest of post-it flags that I didn't skim it, that I absolutely devoured this book, uh, almost like a hungry, 
through hiker on the Pacific Crest Trail. And of course, I'm not the only one who really enjoyed the book. It was a New York Times number one bestseller. It was translated into 30 different languages. And I read that there are 17,000 reviews of Wild on Amazon. And the reviewers give it all kinds of stars. They just loved it. In fact, here's an interesting tidbit. When I got the book in the mail from a third-party seller, I actually found a note tucked into the pages. And it really kind of charmed me because it's, it's a note from Monica to Pat. And it says, Pat. This book is interesting, raw, insightful, and hard to believe. I had to put it down for a while because of certain events. Pass it on when you are done. Love to you. And it was fun to follow Pat's trail through the books and discover what she found to be interesting, raw, and insightful, which were many of the things that I found to be the same. But anyway, simply put, Cheryl, your memoir, Wild, was a gift to me as I make my way down what I'll call the HLT, the human life trail. And this is a trail that every living person is walking. And the ancient Hebrew scriptures talk often about life in trail or path terms. Okay, well, what did I get? What did I gain from Wild? First, I gained wonder about the trail itself. And to my Valley friends, if the PCT is new to you, you should know that it is a two foot wide and 2,653 foot, or pardon me, miles long trail. It's continuous. It stretches from the U.S.-Mexico border all the way to the Canadian border. And it's just Awesome to think about this trek, which goes through 25 national forests and seven national parks and over 10 mountain ranges. And through hikers, as they're called, carry everything on their backs with only occasional opportunities to resupply. Well, Cheryl, thanks to you, I now have a raging case of PCT fever. And I'm hoping to hike at least part of the trail with my wife and and my kids someday. Probably not as much as you did in 1995, uh, but hopefully at least some length of the trail. And as an armchair PCT hiker, uh, with the help of your book, I gained some knowledge about how to do it. Packing light, a second skin for blisters, resupply boxes that you mail to yourself uh, in, in little towns with charming names along the way. So I really did gain some wonder from your book. But more than that, I also gained some wisdom f- about life from you, the, the trail hiker. And your book really helped me to understand life from the perspective of a woman who's almost exactly my age, but who grew up on the opposite side of the country and with deprivations and with sorrows that, that I've never known. So, um, so Valley Church friends, um, I, I want you to get to know Cheryl a little like I have just by letting me share with you some of the themes in, in Wild. Cheryl, you write about parenthood and what a, a child needs from her mom and dad and, and how you really only got a small percentage of what you required to thrive. Um, you know, you write about fatherhood and, and how, sadly, uh, the few good things that you can say about your own biological father would barely fill a haiku poem. And that pain really comes through in your book, how your father didn't father you, but, but menaced you and threatened your mom and your siblings before you all made your reluctant but necessary escape when you were six years old. And you write about grief because you lost your beloved mom, Bobby, when she was only 45. And again, you you were barely a legal adult. And how your mom left a gap the size of Crater Lake 
in your life. And, and you write, nothing could ever bring my mother back or make it okay that she was gone. It broke me up. It cut me off. It tumbled me end over end. And you write about your romantic relationships and your longings and your impulses and your, your pleasures and your regrets from some of your choices, wondering if, as you write, you'll ever succeed at romantic love. And you write about the unraveling of, of your marriage, saying what I had to have when it, when it came to love um, was, was beyond explanation. Um, and it, it just so you write very, very personally and movingly about these experiences. You know, you write about um, touch and about your, your aching need for love and for contact and for companionship. And you write, calling yourself repeatedly through the book, the woman with the hole in her heart. You write, it was the hungry, empty feeling that gave you this constant desire for a companion. And so that desire for touch comes through. I thought this was interesting. You write about yourself puzzling over your own, I guess, humanity and, and inhumanity. You write, what had I done when I squandered my marriage with Paul, the solid, sweet husband who loved me so steadfastly? You know, you, you write about your own desire to be, as you say, responsible and ethical and good, and yet you write so candidly about how likely you are to just smash things up, as you say, and to make a, a mess of things. And, and I know that I can relate, and our Valley Church family can relate, to that self-perplexity that says, why do I do these things that, that hurt me and, and, and hurt others? And along these lines, one of your biggest themes is that of redemption and, and forgiveness and whether we humans need them or just some sort of healing that we give ourselves. And if we do need redemption or forgiveness or healing, from whom do we need them? Do we need them from someone outside of ourselves? Or is this something we give ourselves? And I was struck by these lines. I was sick with myself. I'd burned candles and made proclamations in my journal. I'd come to healthy conclusions about acceptance and gratitude, about fate and forgiveness and fortune. And later, after an unsatisfying, intimate encounter, you write, I was feeling a mounting sense of something that wasn't quite sorrow, wasn't quite regret, and wasn't quite longing, but was a mix of them all. And you write about faith, and you write about prayer, and, and whether you can believe in anything at all. And these lines struck me. I was a terrible believer in things, but I was also a terrible non-believer in things. I was as searching as I was skeptical. I didn't know where to put my faith or if there was such a place, or even precisely what the word faith meant in all of its complexity. Everything seemed to be possibly potent and possibly fake. And you write about men and what makes for a good man. And you write about books, including the ones you read exhaustedly in your tent at night, including the complete stories of Flannery O'Connor, which you call an incredible book. And I agree, she's, she's one of my favorite authors. And speaking of, of good men and books, uh, you had to read O'Connor's most famous short story while on the trail, A Good Man is Hard to Find. Well, more on that in just a minute. In other words, Cheryl, you write about all the issues that I and, and the people in my church are most interested in as we walk the human life trail. Well, why am I kind of reaching out to you in this way? I mean, you and I are basically the same age. You're just a, a smidgen older. And, and we were young then when you took your hike. And now we're middle aged. We're, we're more than halfway down the human life trail. And I believe that because we're all on this trail together with our successes and our shames, uh, our exhilarating moments and our, our big defeats, 
that, that we need to help each other on this path. Um, in fact, recently, uh, I wrote part of this letter to you while staying in a cabin uh, in the shadow of Mount Shasta. And I thought about how almost exactly 25 years ago, you passed by Mount Shasta on your, your hike. And I've just been wondering if you found some answers to the big questions that you ask about life. Well, on the PCT, uh, as I learned from you, people help each other and, and share supplies and, and knowledge because you're all on it together. Well, since every person likewise is walking the HLT, the Human Life Trail, I think that we should share what we've learned and what's been helpful to us as we navigate what I call this trail between two dense clouds. The, the cloud we came out of at birth is like, hey, I'm alive and, and we're first aware. And then the cloud we go into with death, which is the, hey, I, I realize I'm not going to live forever. So, so what happens then? So anyway, your book was honestly a, a helpful gift to me. And, and we want to give you a gift in return. And they're just three short stories out of a world-famous memoir uh, by Matthew. And, and these stories from Matthew's memoir are, are a gift as you make your way on, on the human life trail. And these three stories um, that comprise this memoir, they, they ask one basic question, and it's this, is Jesus a good man? You know, Jesus, you know, a curious person who people were curious about 2,000 years ago. Um, in fact, a man who did a lot of hiking himself. <laughs> he hiked 3,125 miles, people estimate, during his active public life. Well, people in Matthew's day, they were evaluating him. They were appraising his worth and determining whether he was, to use your phrases, possibly potent or possibly fake. Again, that's a huge theme in your book, the quality of the men you meet. And starting with your father and your stepfather, you appraise them and, and they come out wanting. And I invite you to appraise Jesus because, as O'Connor says, a good man is hard to find. And I, I hope you'd consider this Jesus and what kind of man he is. Um, for now, maybe we'll just call him the possibly good man. And, and just want to explore together how he treats people, especially young girls and grown women. Okay, this is from chapter 9 of his memoir. The story starts out, the first of three, while he was saying these things to them, behold, a ruler came in and knelt before him, saying, my daughter has just died, but come and lay your hand on her and she will live. So we meet Jesus, who probably looked like a dust-covered PCT hiker from all of his journey outside. And Jesus is talking when this man, identified by his position, he's a ruler, bows down and pleads on behalf of his, his daughter who has died. And this man has very high social standing in the community, but he's threatened by the permanent loss of his child. And we could say a bundle about the quality of, of this man, this father, just from this sketch. Um, but he's really not the man we're looking at. But we can I, notice that he prioritizes the well-being of his child. And that really is a, a good lesson for us fathers, no matter how important we think we are in the world and how significant our position is, our children need to come first. And Cheryl, I think about this good father and, and how you, you weren't loved rightly by a dad and how, in fact, you were wronged by yours because rather than protecting you, he, he terrorized you and your mom and your siblings, you know, smashing dinner plates and, and threatening you with knuckle sandwiches. And yet still you were devoted to him and you hated the idea of divorce, which you, you wrote seemed like the very worst thing that could happen. And yet you, you loved him, and you wrote, in spite of everything, uh, I loved my dad and knew that if my mom divorced him, I'd lose him 
And I was right. Well, this dad in the story, I think the best thing about him is his boldness in bringing Jesus to his daughter. And, and, and speaking of, of this theme, you know, and switching to your mom for a minute, you, you write just so tenderly about your mom and how she was a force of love in your life. She was the keeper of your life, as you say. She came at you and your siblings with maximum maternal velocity. But then later, you, you, you ponder her shortcomings as you wrestle with her legacy. And in her last days of life in the hospital, you describe your own desperate efforts at prayer And these words you wrote really struck me. You said, it was the same when I tried to pray. I prayed fervently, rabidly to God, any God, to a God I could not identify or find. I cursed my mother who'd not given me any religious education. Resentful of her own repressive Catholic upbringing, she'd avoided church altogether in her adult life. And now she was dying and I didn't even have God. And I just think about how just heartrending that is to think that, Cheryl, nobody brought God to you. And, and I want you to just notice in this story the father's conviction about this mysterious, possibly good man, Jesus. Again, looking at the second part of verse 18, he says, matter of factly, but come and lay your hand on her. And she will live. This father has this conviction about Jesus' capability and his his contact ability. And, And the word which you write about with uncertainty is faith. We just see it in this man who says to Jesus, just come, just be close, just place your hand Interestingly, not even two hands, just place your hand because one hand is enough in the perspective of this ruler. Place your hand on her and and she'll rise up. She'll reanimate. She'll resume her young life. Just amazing conviction about Jesus. And the question is, how did it form? Where did he get this idea that Jesus could raise her out of death with a simple touch? And the answer is reports about him. He heard five-star reviews from the masses about Jesus. And earlier in, in Matthew's memoir, Jesus has been delivering people facing this whole plethora of threats like leprosy, paralysis, fever, demons, and storms. There's no threat to human well-being that's beyond Jesus's capability to neutralize. And his reputation spreads like wildfire as a result. Well, what does the possibly good man do here? <laughs> does he scorn the father? Does he, does he tell him to wait his turn? Does he go in the other direction? Does he, he threaten him? No. Verse 19, and Jesus rose and followed him with his disciples. Jesus just makes a beeline for this girl following her dad. Jesus prioritizes the well-being of this nondescript 12-year-old child. And and wow, we we see that and go, okay, he's a good man, but can he do anything because she's dead? Well, before finishing that story, um, Another story intrudes itself. It's, it's an embedded story in, in, in Matthew's memoir. It's a story within the story. Uh, the, the, the first story is the outer story, and we'll call this one the inner story. And it, it starts out in verse 20. And behold, a woman who had suffered from a discharge of blood for 12 years came up behind him and touched the fringe of his garment. For she said to herself, if I only touch his garment, I will be made well. Well, let's break this down. Unlike the ruler who is at the very center of social life, this woman is at the periphery. She has this socially and physically debilitating illness, this this chronic 
hemorrhage that would have made relationships and worship in her community very difficult because of ceremonial uncleanness. But, but just like the ruler, she's threatened severely by this illness because both high and low alike face threats. And like the ruler, she has this conviction about Jesus that he's capable and that he's, again, contactable. And we know she has faith. This is so amazing because we are let in on her self-talk. All I got to do is touch him and I'll be okay. And the tense of the verb in the Greek language that this memoir was written in suggests that she says this over and over again. All I got to do is touch him. All I got to do is touch him. Then I'll be well. Then I'll be well. Well, like the ruler, her, her conviction is formed, how? By reports about Jesus. What the, the people all around are saying about his power and his approachability. And just like the ruler, her conviction expresses itself in wild action. In, in uh, action that her contemporaries would probably label rash. And she approaches him from behind and makes what she thinks will be unnoticed contact with him, just touching the very tip of his cloak. Well, will she get the same response from this possibly good man <laughs> that the ruler did, where, where he drops everything and, and follows the dad? Does Jesus treat women differently? Well, verse 22, Jesus turned and seeing her he said take heart daughter your faith has made you well and instantly the woman was made well notice again how he pivots he changes course just like he did for the ruler he just turns and, and everything stops probably her heart as well when she detects that that he knew that she had touched him, and she's probably thinking, oh no, what will he do? Will he, in anger, reverse this cure that has just alleviated my 12 years of suffering? But no, listen, listen to his affectionate response. He calls her daughter, and he says, take heart. And, and he, he says that, um, that your faith has made you well. And, and she's healed at that moment. And this is so interesting. When he says your faith has made you well, it, it, in, in the healings of Jesus, this word for, for made well is never used just to refer to a single part of the body, but always to the whole person. Again, she doesn't just get physical relief, but she gets a comprehensive restoration from this touch. It's not just her body that works the way it should. It's her emotional burden is lifted by Jesus. She's, she's whole. The hole in her heart has been filled by Jesus through faith. Again, like the father in story one, he's saying, your conviction about me is consequential. It, it, it's bringing healing to you that you have confidence in me, that I am capable, and that you can contact me in, in, that you had courage to be a little wild, to reach out and touch me, has transformed you. Okay, but I'm just getting a little ahead of myself here. Back to story one, the outer ring story. Verse 23. And when Jesus came to the ruler's house and saw the flute players and the crowd making a commotion, well, we'll pause there. Jesus arrives at the ruler's house, and the, the funeral burial process is already in motion. It's an unspeakably bitter scene with mourners playing these sad melodies on their instruments. And another version of the same event reports that all were weeping and mourning. Really, this is a picture of people beating their chests because of their pain regarding this lost child. And the, the Jews, they don't hold back when they grieve. They just roar with, with pain. And grief without hope is even more bitter. And, and you write at one point because you grieved so 
powerfully when you lost your mom. The universe, I'd learned, was never, ever kidding. It would take whatever it wanted, and it would never give it back. Well, just in, in this story, let, let's see uh, what happens, because the possibly good man will say something that's either cruel or bizarre or just incredibly kind. Verse 24a, he said, go away, for the girl is not dead, but sleeping. And this could be heard as a, almost a sick joke, because Jesus, she's dead. Don't you know that? But here's what the possibly good man seems to be saying, and he often talked cryptically. It's death, he seems to be saying, happened, yes, but because of me, death can be softened to the impact of sleep. Almost like in a fairy tale where the long-awaited royal prince comes and makes contact with the, the sleeping or, or dead princess, and she comes back to life. But Matthew's story is, is no fairy tale. It, it, it's a memoir like yours. It's a, it's a true story. Matthew 9, 23b says the reaction of the mourners, and they laughed at him. Well, Jesus healed the body and filled the heart of a living woman. In, in story number two, you know, daughter, take heart. Your faith has made you well. But can he possibly restart the heart of a dead person? Verse 25, but when the crowd had been put aside, he went and took her by the hand and the girl arose Notice the phrase, took her by the hand. This is even stronger than it sounds in English. It almost means to seize or take control. And here is a strong touch from a man, but without terror and without injury, unlike in your family, Cheryl. Uh, and what happens? The girl gets up. She's called back to life. And can you imagine the reaction? If they were all beating their breasts when she died, what would they have done when she sits up and her eyes open and she begins to walk around? You know, I don't think they were laughing anymore. They must have been utterly shocked. You know, a lot of people do laugh at people who claim to love Jesus, but not too many people I've met. Uh, in fact, I can't think of anybody who laughs at Jesus because you just can't. He's such a good man as these stories show us. And, and maybe he's even more than just a good man. Well, well, someone once said, Jesus appeals to the soul as light appeals to the eye and as love appeals to the heart. You know, and it's, it's, it's so interesting thinking about Jesus. Well, you know, you talk so much about the universe taking but not giving back. But according to Christian belief, here is the one who made the universe, giving this daughter back to her father. Verse 26, and the report of this went through all that district. And the news keeps spreading as more and more people hear these stories about Jesus. And they gain conviction about his capability and his contact ability. And they reach out when he walks by. And people like you who, who claim, well, you're not good at believing, like you say, they often get better at it when they read these stories about him. And they make like the ruler and they make like the woman and they, they reach out and their lives are transformed. Well, there's just one, one last story here, at story three, and I call it um, an overlapping story. Um, and it has a lot in common with the first two. And in fact, it actually shares an identical line. I mean, a word for word line from the inner story. Uh, we, we've seen Jesus save people from emotional and physical threats. He makes them well. He saves those who have conviction about his power and how approachable he is. But, but Cheryl, you know, your pain has a different dimension to it because you write about doing things that later you deeply regret and that disturb you. And, and, and we at Valley can all relate 
to that experience of regret and remorse for the choices that we have made. And in one of the most really powerful parts of your memoir where you describe your inner turmoil and, 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 and your guilt, I guess I would call it, and you write, I didn't want to torment myself with all the ways I'd wronged my ex-husband. What if I forgave myself, I thought. What if I forgave myself even though I'd done something I shouldn't have? What if I were a liar and a cheat and there was no excuse for what I'd done other than because it was what I wanted and needed to do? What if I was sorry but if I could go back in time, I wouldn't do anything differently than I had done. What if I was never redeemed? What if I already was? Like I said in the beginning of this letter to you, um, your book probes this question. Atonement or analysis, redemption or healing, what do we need as human beings? And this question drives your hike. It drives you onto the PCT. You say, perhaps being amidst the undesecrated beauty of the wilderness meant that I too could be undesecrated, regardless of what I'd lost or what had been taken from me, regardless of the regrettable things I'd done to others or myself or the regrettable things that had been done to me. And that's why this last story, it speaks to that question you ask, because story three is also about a woman under threat, in this case by guilt, from having smashed things up, probably in her personal relationships. She's described simply as a sinner with no further details. But somehow, like the ruler and like the formerly hemorrhaging woman, she's developed conviction about Jesus, again, that he's capable and that he's contactable because she's heard the reports. And one day she hears that Jesus is dining at the home of a Pharisee. And then her conviction, it wells up and expresses itself in wild, rash action. Verse 37, she brought an alabaster flask of ointment and standing behind him at his feet, Weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. Well, here is the question we face for the third time. What will the possibly good man do in this case? Because here's this woman touching him. And even the dinner host, Simon, who was appraising Jesus, says in verse 39, If this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. And then Jesus, so surprisingly, turns and he comments to Simon on this conviction-driven, wild, crazy action of this woman. And here's what Jesus says. When I came into your house, Simon, you gave me no water for my dirty hiking feet. But she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You didn't greet me with the kiss that was the custom in those days. But from the time I came in, she hasn't stopped kissing my feet. You didn't pour soothing oil on my hot, sweaty head in welcome, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. And then he says to him, her many sins, her multiple, plural, smash-ups are forgiven because she's come to me with full penitential velocity expressed in these remarkable actions of love. And then he turns from Simon to this woman who's made such a mess of things. And he says to her heart, your sins are forgiven. Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. She's redeemed, but she's not just redeemed. She's healed too. Because Jesus gives her this blessing. Go in peace. Well, these words, your faith has saved you. Where have we heard that before? Those are the exact words he said to the hemorrhaging woman. And I put the two together in blue ink 
in the, in the notes that I prepared for this letter. And they're translated just a little differently in English because of the context. But it's the exact same phrase that he says to both. And I, I hope that this story speaks to your question about redemption versus healing that runs through wild. Because I want to leave you with this, Cheryl. Those with conviction about Jesus who reach out when he walks by, they receive forgiveness for the wrongs they've done, and they receive healing for the wrongs done to them. They are saved, made well, redeemed, and refreshed. And these words, uh, your faith has made you well, are, are the words in Greek in, uh, that um, you'll see splashed across this beautiful painting that my friend Michaela painted for this letter to you, inspired by these three stories. And you can see these three stories reflected in this painting. And I'm going to send you a copy, Cheryl, it's just as a little gift from Valley Church. And I think, honestly, we have proof that Jesus um, is a good man. And the truth is, he's not hard to find at all when we reach out to him because he's reachable no matter the wretched things we've done. But we have to reach. You know, another thought too, he can forgive because as we uh, consider his identity, he's not just a good man, he's God too according to the, the, the scriptures. And he proved it by raising that girl from the dead in the inner story. In fact, back for a minute to a good man is hard to find, which I know you read on the trail, I think somewhere in the Sierras. You know uh, from this story, the implications or the authority of someone who raises the dead, according to Flannery O'Connor's story and this line stated by this tortured soul in the story who had done wrong. And he says so famously, Jesus was the only one that ever raised the dead and he shouldn't have done it. He's shown everything off balance. If he did what he said, then it's nothing for you to do, but throw away everything and follow him. And if he didn't, then it's nothing for you to do, but enjoy the few minutes you got left the best you can. You know, Jesus raised the dead, and like O'Connor's character points out, we must consider and we must choose once we know this. Well, how did Jesus redeem and heal those who reach for him? In your story, we read about how you nicknamed your backpack monster. The 70-pound weight you lug hundreds and hundreds of miles. Well, Jesus cinched our packs, our monsters of sin onto his back and he hiked to the cross and an ancient prophecy predicted he would and said, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace and with his wounds, we are healed. And like the girl in the story, God raised Jesus from the dead and he's alive. Well, who did Jesus do this for? Whose packs did he carry? I was just so struck by your unusual last name, Strayed, and, and how you narrate that you gave it to yourself after your divorce. And I thought, you know, Cheryl, that last name strayed is the surname or should be for the entire human race because the Bible says that all we like sheep have gone astray. We've all, not some of us, we've all turned everyone to his own way. And yet the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Cheryl, in conclusion, I think Jesus can fill the hole in your heart and forgive and heal you, and satisfy that cavern within. It's what you memorably call your ravenous need for love. You know, just personally, he met those needs in me. He met my need for cleansing. He met my need to be undesecrated. He met my need for companionship that, that never fails. And I'd encourage you to keep exploring him and reaching out 
with your hands and your heart and opening your inner being to Him because I think these words are maps to the greatest kind of flourishing. And now Cheryl and Valley, um, I want to introduce you to my friend, Kathy Auer, who is going to share how Jesus touched her. Hi, I'm Kathy Auer, and uh, Darren asked me if I would get up and share my t story with you. So I was just going to tell uh, a little bit about my story. My parents took us to church, but it was just something that we would do occasionally, uh, maybe at Easter, maybe Christmas, maybe a few other times. So when I was in college, people had invited me to come to a Bible study and gave me a Bible, and I started reading, and I prayed for Christ to come into my life and be real to me while I was in college. And I prayed, and I waited, and nothing happened. And so I thought, hey, I was here. Where were you? And so I kind of went and did my merry own way. So I continued um, just living life for myself. I felt like there was an emptiness and something missing in my life. I felt kind of restless. But uh, I ended up coming out to California, and I went to West Valley College. I met Alex in February in 1981, and we were engaged in June. So it was pretty short. I was driving along uh, El Camino and trying to think of what to get him for a wedding gift. I kept thinking, mm, what should I get him? What should I get him? And I wasn't really sure what to get him. And I felt like I was drawn to this Sunnyvale Christian bookstore on El Camino. And I went in there, and it's never happened again. But at this time, I felt like there was a voice that said, get him a Bible. And I thought, whoa. So I went up to the counter. I said, I'd like to get a Bible. And they said, well, what kind? I thought, I didn't know they have different kinds. But uh, they recommended a New American Standard. So I got him a Bible for a wedding gift and had his name put on it. And we had never discussed religion, never any discussion. So then we decided we wanted to find a church to get married in. And we came to Valley. And Valley said, well, we, we'll have you go through counseling. And we said, well, thank you, but we're not, we don't want counseling. We want to get married. So we ended up getting married up at Portola Valley Church in, Cooper, in uh, Portola Valley. And I gave him the Bible as a wedding gift. And so we got back from our honeymoon and we started reading a little bit. And it was uh, soon after that, maybe a couple months after that, I found out I was pregnant. And I said, I do not want any children. And Alex like, hey, whatever, I don't care, whatever you want. And so I had an abortion. And I did not feel bad about it at all. Um, just like, oh, don't want it, don't want kids. So I had an abortion and right after we were married. So then in a couple years after we were married, we decided to start coming to church. So we came to Valley Church and the first people we met uh, were John and Kelly Drake. And John and Kelly Drake invited us to come to a Bible study. So we had a couple drinks and we went to the Bible study. We could not even find the index in the Bible. So they said, you know, we're just like trying to fumble around and not draw attention to ourselves. So, but we eventually, we came and the people were so warm and so welcoming to us. And probably a couple months after that, they invited us to come to Hume for couples. So we went to Hume and Ken Poor uh, was the speaker. And he was talking about, are you living for Christ? And I'd always heard, do you believe in Christ? And I think believing in Christ was the same as, do you believe in Santa? Do you believe in the tooth fairy? Do you believe in Peter Pan? You know, and I thought, sure, I believe. And I'd never heard, are you living for Christ? And that was a turning point for me. And I came back from that trip and uh, I thought, I want to live for Christ. I want to think about him. I want to think about his word. And God at that time gave me a desire for children because I didn't have, want any children. And so after that trip, uh, and God had done a work in my heart and gave me a desire for children. Well, I got pregnant. But the whole pregnancy, there was a struggle. And wondering, oh, wait, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. And it's like, wait, God is good. He is enough. But an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. And I struggled the whole pregnancy. 
Um, I went to Hawaii. I was in a wedding. I came back from the wedding, and the doctor said, your baby hasn't grown. And I thought, hmm. And he said, you're having the baby tomorrow. I said, well, let's discuss this. My parents are coming from out of town. We have a lot. He said, you're having the baby tomorrow. And so I did. I had the baby the next day, and it was a very small baby. The baby had not been growing. And the baby could fit in a shoebox. So it was a very small little baby. And I thought, after 11 days, they said, your baby can come home. And when I brought that baby home and I thought, God, why are you good? God does not give us what we deserve. He is a wonderful God and a loving God. And he has blessed us in so many ways. So that little, little tiny baby has grown and grown. And we are so thankful for God for filling that emptiness in our hearts we also made some very good friends that helped us on this journey. So like Mike and Betty Hahn. Well, we used to play a game. Betty's very competitive. Well, we're competitive too. But played this game, and we played games. We helped tear off Ralph Bird's roof off his house. And while we were there, we would play games and Bible name games. And we learned about the Bible. And friends just came alongside us and helped us on this journey. So... We have seen God's blessing, but to me, you have to be careful because to me, it's very easy to be caught up in bondage when you caught up in guilt. And this guilt, I don't believe is from God. I think it was from Satan. And when we have all this bondage and we feel like uh, we can't do anything for God or that he doesn't love us or he's not enough. And so to me, um, my message of encouragement, when you think about the women, you think about the message Darren talked about, some of the, the lady uh, in the Bible, ladies that other ladies that have struggled, and we think God is good. And I really believe it's important. Come alongside other people. Give the burden to God. Trust him because he loves you so much. And there's a wonderful picture of all the blessings in our family. And this is all the people in our family we blessed with. We have six kids. I had six kids in nine and a half years, and they are such a blessing. And this is a picture of everybody in the family except for the tallest and the youngest. So Travis and Sage, but we have been so blessed by the Lord. So since the Lord is a part of us and he's changed us, we get to sing, Since Jesus Came Into My Heart. What a wonderful change in my life has been wrought Since Jesus came into my heart I have light in my soul for which long I had sought Since Jesus came into my heart Since Jesus came into my heart Since Jesus came into my heart of joy o'er my soul like a sea billows roll since Jesus came into my heart I have ceased from my wandering and going astray since Jesus came into my heart and my sins which were many are all washed away since Jesus came into
Well, Cheryl and Valley, thank you for being uh, a part of today's uh, gathering. Uh, and Cheryl, since you have us all hyped up now about hiking, um, I invite you and I invite Valley Church to hike with me and my friend Wendy Tomer this Wednesday at Rancho San Antonio Preserve at 8 a.m. Cheryl, I know it's very unlikely that you would be in the Bay Area this week, but we would love to meet you and hike with you and hear more stories. Again, it's 8 a.m. on Wednesday. It's moderate. We're going to go up some hills, but you can do it. Um, it's not the PCT after all, and so we hope that you can join us for that and hope that you will have a great week, and uh, we invite you to go in peace.